Bible prophecy alive today concerning Israel. That's the title that we shall be considering this evening. And whilst uh, preparing for this evening's talk, I've gotten into quite a few conversations with um, lots of different people. And it would seem that I think um, a few of us, quite many of us perhaps, often get uh, put off sometimes by looking into prophecy. Uh, perhaps we find it quite difficult with the dates and the, the way that pa the uh, passages in Scripture relate to these prophecies and how we put them all together. But hopefully this evening um, that won't be the case and we uh, won't find it too off-putting. And In fact, hopefully we shall be excited uh, by, by the prophecies that we, we are going to look at this evening. And hopefully it will uh, strengthen our faith, especially with what we see happening in the news around us. It almost appears that uh, every day, while I was preparing for this talk, I'd have to change a slide as it became slightly uh, outdated with what was happening in the news. So, what we're going to look at this evening, I think it'd be helpful just to briefly consider what exactly prophecy is, and uh, to go over briefly the value of prophecy, and then to remind ourselves how that relates to Israel, and how Israel is absolutely crucial to God's purpose, and then to look at prophecies that have been fulfilled concerning Israel, and then to have a look at future prophecies concerning Israel. And apologies if uh, this appears slightly more like a lecture uh, than a Bible class, but um, obviously, uh, hopefully we shall look into this in a bit more depth uh, than, than a lecture. So, let's think a bit now about what prophecy is. So, I've just put up on the screen here, uh, looking at the word prophecy in Scripture. So, how it's translated in the Old Testament and how it's translated in the New Testament. If we, um, first of all, look at the Old Testament, I just put into strong concordance the word prophecy. Sorry, uh, yeah, prophecy. I always get confused between prophecy and pro prophesy. So we're looking at prophecy first. Let's go to 2 Chronicles and chapter 15. Well, obviously, it's quite a simple point, but prophecy, it's a prediction about the future. But the, the value of that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, in 2 Chronicles 15, uh, the context is um, Asa is king. And a prophet is sent to Asa in verse 1. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him, and if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. It's quite a simple prediction of the future. If you follow God, he will be with you. And the effect of that was, was it was meant to have an effect on Asa. If we go to verse 8, we see this word prophesy, prophecy. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet... He took courage and put away the abominable, abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin. So the point I'm trying to make here is that prophecy should have an effect on us. When we, ha when we see the prediction or hear the prediction, that should have an effect on our hearts and make us change our behaviour. So with the prophecies which we shall be considering this evening, hopefully we shall take them to heart and realise that things are happening in our lives. We can see that on the news every day and it should strengthen our faith. Now, that's uh, one word there for prophecy, prophesy in the, in the Old Testament, Nebao. The other word, uh, Masao, which is translated prophecy uh, in, in the English uh, versions, um, is also translated more often uh, burden. So we might be more familiar with that translation. If we go to Isaiah, it's also translated prophecy, but a lot of the time it's translated burden. We're probably familiar with all these... Um, Examples, as you go through Isaiah, it's the burden of, and then a country. So in Isaiah 13, verse 1, it's the burden of Babylon. In Isaiah 17, verse 1, it's the burden of Damascus. And in 19, verse 1, it's the burden of Egypt. And this um, other word for prophecy is meant to have more of um, uh, maybe a poetical nature to it, or it's meant to have more of um, an aspect of doom if you, if you look at the uh, Strong's definition. 
And it's meant to be a warning to people. And again, it's meant to have an effect on their behavior. It's a warning that if they don't repent, then bad things uh, may, may come. So, and obviously we should be looking at Zechariah, which we, we read just a few moments ago, which is the burden for Israel and the warnings that uh, were going to come on Israel. But we have, continuing into the New Testament, exactly the same message when we look at what prophecy is. And um, it's helpful uh, when looking at words to try and find out their meaning, to remember that there's lots of different ways um, you, know, you can use a word. So uh, I thought it wasn't used very often, prophecy. Um, but then obviously if you look at the word prophesy, you get it uh, occurring a, a, lot, a lot more. We'll look at um, 1 Corinthians 14 very briefly. Because if you were thinking that uh, prophecy is um, not something which we should uh, put a lot of effort into, or it's not for everyone, well actually if we look at 1 Corinthians 14, it's something which we should all be desiring to um, look into more. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So it was something in the New Testament times to be desired. And it was something that was meant to help people. It was meant to strengthen their faith. With it being someone who was inspired by the Spirit to speak forth God's word. We carry on in verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So that was something that was more beneficial to the person than to his fellow brothers and sisters. Continuing on, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But, here's the contrast, he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And uh, we won't go to 2 Peter, but there it's saying that prophecy, prophecy was being inspired by God to speak forth his words. It wasn't, it's not the words of man. Um, finally, we'll just look at Revelation chapter 1. Obviously, we're disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are trying to live lives that are worthy of his calling. And it's his revelation in the apocalypse. Uh, revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is who we are following. These are the words which he has given, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants, and we are obviously Christ's servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And in verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that, hear, they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. But we won't, we won't be looking too much at Revelation this evening, but the principle applies generally to prophecy. It's something that we should all be trying to look into um, as much as we are able. And of course, we can see the big picture most of the time fairly easily, but the details are obviously sometimes more, more obscure and we're not always going to agree with the, the nitty gritty, but that's, that's fine. We can, as it says, iron sharpeneth iron, so does a brother sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So we're all meant to, we're meant to discuss these things to strengthen, strengthen our faith. So Israel, this is what we'll be... This is what we're looking at this evening. And the hope of Israel is the hope of humanity. The, the whole Bible centers around, obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ, but in relation to God's people, Israel. And it's something I think a lot of uh, Christians today have completely forgotten about. Now, let's start at the beginning, and we go to Genesis 14. We think of our subject this evening... Bible prophecy alive today. From the moment that God gave promises to Abraham, Bible prophecy concerning Israel has been alive. Sorry, I said Genesis 14, I meant 17, with promises to Abraham. So Abraham was 90 years old in verse 1, 90 years old in 9, when the Lord appeared to him. And he says in verse 2, I will make a covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thy seed exceedingly. That's one prediction, and it's come true. Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. 
Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham. Thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant. So right from the very beginning, prophecy concerning Israel has always had the idea of an everlasting component to it, which is the gospel. We know that the gospel was first preached to Abraham, and that we, through faith, are heirs of those promises that were made to Abraham. Verse 8, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, and all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So these, these predictions, prophecies, are talking about things in this world, tangible things that we can all see. We can look at Israel, we can see it on a map, we can go there. It is, it's, ha- it's going to happen, and we believe it's going to happen soon. Now, we carry on in the Old Testament, we go to Isaiah 43. And God has not cast off his people, despite the number of times that they have disobeyed him and gone astray. God comforts uh, his people in these chapters. And he says in verse 1, But now, thus saith the Lord, that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. And in verse 10, he says to them, Ye are my witnesses. Israel, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Verse 12, I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Israel are witnesses that the Lord is God. We can look to Israel as evidence that there is a God. And I think whenever we have moments where we go through difficulties in life and our faith is weakened, there's no stronger evidence for there being a God than the nation of Israel and what the Bible has said about them that would happen and has happened and is going to happen in the future. Unfortunately, people have uh, missed that point and they think that Israel no longer has a part in God's, in God's plan. Can anybody read the top line in, on the, uh, the top of the page for Isaiah 43? This is something that I noticed the other day which was quite remarkable. God comforts the church with his promises. Yeah, so I've been reading this version for a number of years and never picked up on the fact that the, uh, the descriptions at the top of the page can be quite misleading sometimes. There's a whole division of Christianity, I think it's called replacement theology, that basically says that the modern church has replaced Israel. The promises made to Israel no longer apply to the nation of Israel today. The prophecies concerning Israel actually apply to the church, the the Christian church, um, and it's quite interesting, all the pro- promises and the blessings apply to the church, when you look at pages that are talking about the um, punishments or the, the curses, they still apply to the nation of Israel. Now, if we go to the New Testament, we will see that that is completely not the case. We go to Romans chapter 11, Paul says under inspiration in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And I, I don't want to spend too long on this, so we'll just move over to um, verse 17. And he uses the analogy of an, an olive tree, a wild olive tree, a natural olive tree. And he says that Israel, Abraham from Jacob, I, Isaac and Jacob, they were the, the lump, as it were. And they, they, they are the natural olive tree. Um, Verse 17, and if some of the branches be broken off, that's later, later Israel, when they disobeyed God. And now being a wild olive tree, that's the, the Christians, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. 
boastest not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Perhaps the uh, publishers of the authorised version in their description at the top of the page were being quite high-minded to put that, uh, those blessings as the church. Verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, natural Israel, take heed lest he spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. So that's just a, a warning to us all to remember that Israel is very much part of God's plan and purpose still. So we're going to look briefly at some of the prophecies that have already been fulfilled and hopefully they'll give us confidence in the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. So I'm sure we're all quite familiar with these. The survival of the Jewish nation, the persecution of the Jewish nation, the destruction of Jerusalem, the regathering of the Jewish nation to the land of Israel, the land of Israel prospering when the Jews returned to the land, and Jerusalem becoming a burdensome stone. So we're looking at the survival of the Jewish nation, first of all. And this is an absolute miracle, if you compare it by human standards. This was a quote from Benjamin Disraeli in 1835. Yes, I am a Jew, and when the ancestors of the right honourable gentlemen were brutal savages in an unknown island, Mine were priests in the Temple of Solomon. And the point he was making is that even when the, uh, the other member of Parliament that he was debating with, his ancestors were, as he puts it, savages. Even then, that long ago, his ancestors were already an advanced civilization. And Mark Twain asked the question, what is the secret of the Jews' immortality? No other nation on the planet has lasted this long. And you can look in uh, Wikipedia and see uh, nations that have existed. These are all apparently nations, according to Wikipedia, that have existed in the past. Um, some of obviously the ancient names, Egypt for example, that have now ceased to exist. But we know that the reason for their immortality is that they are God's people. Jeremiah 30 verse 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. And we look at now the persecution of the Jewish nation. It's true that God said that if you obey me, I'll bless you. But also, there was a caveat to that. And if they did not obey God, they would be cursed. And they have indeed been cursed throughout the centuries. The pogroms in Russia, the Spanish Inquisition... And of course, more modern atrocities are testament to the fact they have been isolated and persecuted as a nation. The destruction of Jerusalem. Obviously, this has happened a few times. There is uh, the destruction by Babylon, which we won't look at. But there's also the Mount Olivet prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ that predicted Jerusalem would be destroyed. Let's just turn to Matthew 24. And this prophecy, I think, is um, similar, perhaps, to the way that Revelation is um, split up in terms of it being a continuous historic that Jesus talks about things which would happen to Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and he ends with things that are going to happen at his return. But he's, and the benefit of that is that if the beginning of his prophecy comes true, we can have faith that the end of the prophecy will also come true. And he says to his disciples in, in verse 2, Jesus said to them, See not all these things? And looking at the temple. Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that came true in AD 70. You can see that today, that the temple no longer stands. Uh, and we'll stay in Matthew, and I'll just read uh, the description in Luke. Uh, which Jesus says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So the prophecy was meant to help them. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. 
So part of the prophecy had come true. They knew that that meant that the Roman armies were about to attack and they were given an opportunity to flee. And indeed that happened. The armies of Rome came and utterly destroyed um, the Jewish way of life in Jerusalem. But we know then that because these things have happened, we know that eventually Jesus will return, and that is what we are looking, looking towards. Um, the other prophecy which has come true in many of our lifetimes, the regathering of the Jewish nation. Now, people say this is perhaps a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't, when you look at the details of how it happened, I don't think you can say that is the case. And it was... It was um, a prophecy that people were able to predict. Bible students throughout the ages um, were able to see that this was going to have to happen before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was written in 1849 by John Thomas, and he was not the only one that made this prediction. But hun almost 100 years before the event took place, this is what he wrote, based on what he'd read in the Bible. The truth is, there are two stages in the restoration of the Jews. The first is before the Battle of Armageddon, and the second after it, but both pre-millennial. God has said, I will save the tents of Judah first. This is the first stage of restoration. There is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes. After he has appeared in the kingdom, the pre-adventural colonization of Palestine will be on purely political principles, and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. And that is what happened. And obviously we know where he based um, his evidence for that happening. Uh, it's from the, the Old Testament and the rest of the Bible. And indeed, that happened in 1948. The world was shocked by the fact that Israel was now a state after almost 2,000 years. And it happened despite human efforts. What I mean by that, there was, there was a lot of effort by other people to make sure it didn't happen. Britain at the time didn't want it to happen. The Arab nations certainly didn't want it to happen at the time. Many Jews didn't want it to happen. They'd become very comfortable, um, obviously before the Second World War, in the nations that they had assimilated into. And even in 1948, there were many Jews who still didn't want the nation to become uh, reborn. And if you thought that was amazing enough, the fact, the very next day, it was attacked by the combined forces of the five Arab armies. And the fact that they survived this attack is described as a modern miracle. So on the first day of the, of the State of Israel declaring itself independent, Five armies surrounding the country uh, converged on this infant country in order to wipe it off the face of the world. We had, uh, as you can see here on the map, these are the five combined forces with Egypt, um, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, um, Assyria and Lebanese attacking Israel. Now who, who would win? On human terms, it, it's a no-brainer. Um, it was described uh, by some people, um, Herbert Arger in 1960, in the book Saving the Remnant, no military explanation for the failure of the Arabs is plausible. No one knows how the Arabs lost. Um, Sykes C. in Crossroads to Israel, no fact in the history of the 20th century is more staggeringly improbable than the state of Israel. And the land has prospered. Since the Jews have been going back to the land, um, as it says in Ezekiel 38, the, the land, the wildlife, the, the, the towns, the economy would prosper. Um, in fact, in 1939, it was Winston Churchill who wrote or said, The historic dream has proved its power to succeed. Jewish colonists made the desert blue, a score of thriving industries, a great city on a barren shore, electricity throughout the land. And it's remarkable from what it had been before the Jews started to go back to the land, to what it was when they established themselves there. And people have um, been documenting this for a while now. You can see, I'm not sure exactly where in Israel this is. I know this is in black and white, so it's maybe a bit unfair, this is in colour. But you can still see that 
before the Jews started to go back to the land and compare that to modern day, the number of fields and cultivation that has gone on. And perhaps this shows it much better, a satellite image of the greenness in Israel compared to the surrounding area of barren desert. And Tel Aviv today, from what it was less than 100 years ago, is, is staggering how, uh, how much progress, progress has been made. So coming to the last one that has kind of been fulfilled or is in the process of still being fulfilled, Jerusalem becoming a burdensome stone. And we're seeing this every day in the news. We read it in our opening, cha- in our opening chapter, Zechariah chapter 12. If we just turn there. Verse 3. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, that all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And in the last 12 months, we have seen uh, this come to fruition. And if anything shows you that the most high ruler in the kingdom of men is the fact that the man Donald Trump was elected president, and he has changed this, uh, this verse in terms of making it uh, come to life, quite literally. Presidents before him, who had been given the task of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, the American embassy, had all said they would do it, but none had actually... Um, they had talked the talk, but they hadn't actually walked the walk and done it. But we know last December he signed his executive order and put that into effect. And that verse is now becoming more of a reality. Uh, he said it was a wonderful thing, but many people didn't. The Pope said, I cannot silence my deep concern over the situation that has emerged in recent days. At the same time, I appeal strongly for all to respect the city's status quo in accordance with the relevant UN resolutions. And the UN, uh, head of the UN, um, Mr. Guterro, uh, President, Trump, President Trump's statement will jeopardize the prospect of peace for Israelis and Palestinians. Jerusalem is a final status issue that must be resolved through direct negotiations between the two parties. And the French, not too happy either. Uh, and the Germans, even more unhappy. But we can see that this is becoming an issue for the entire world. The UN recently votes resoundingly to reject Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital. So hopefully we have enough time to carry on and look at future prophecies that are being fulfilled. And I think this, the three passages that I've looked at, um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Zechariah 12 to 14, and Joel 2 and 3, I, I would suggest are talking about the same events. And to, the, to our minds, I think we often like to read text and see it in a chronological order. But I think the way the Bible is written, it's easier when we read these passages to kind of think of each section as a, a piece of a jigsaw puzzle and not to see it as a chronological narrative of what is going to happen. This is going to happen, then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen but rather to see that it's talking about one aspect of an event in one way, and it moves on, and it might talk about another aspect of the event that happened before or after, uh, but just from a different perspective. So you can see that I've broken down the different um, parts of prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. So we've got the confederacy of nations talked about, that there will be a confederacy of nations that come, that attacks Israel, God's jealousy is kindled for his people. There's an earthquake. The confederacy is destroyed. True religion is restored. And Israel is blessed. And I think that's largely the, the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. That there, obviously, there might be more. So, here we have uh, Ezekiel 38. Uh, Joel 2 and Zechariah 14, verse 2. And I've written them all down there for you. But I think you can see from the language that they are talking about the same things. Um, Ezekiel 38, And thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And in verse uh, 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. And uh, verse 6, uh, the north quarters uh, of Goma and all his bands of Hashem to Gama, the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. And it, it talks about the northern in, uh, invader in, in Joel, 
It talks about all nations. And we can see how with the United Nations now that can easily be happen, uh, easily be fulfilled with the United Nations peace mission being sent to Israel. Um, and Zechariah 14, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Um, and I've put this map up here to show that these nations are largely agreed. Um, in Ezekiel 38, other versions, the NASB puts it as a uh, go the chief of Rosh, and I think most people agree that that is Russia. Goma is suggested as France, Tagama, Turkey, Magog, those nations there. Obviously, Persia is pretty easy to see that's Iran. Um, so we can see that there's going to be a confederacy that's going to come against Israel. We can see that happening in the news now. The battle lines are being drawn. And we know that this confederacy will attack Israel. Ezekiel 38, verse 16. And thou shalt come against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And you can see that this language is very similar in Joel. Um, Joel chapter, it's chapter 3 and verse 2. Sorry, chapter, Joel chapter 2, verse 2 talks about um, this army coming towards Israel and it describes it as a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. That's very similar to Ezekiel 38 verse 16. Um, this army is going to come against, his, against God's people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And Zechariah 14 obviously agrees that it's going to be against Israel, against Jerusalem. So this imposing army is going to attack Israel. And at that point, it says that God's jealousy will be kindled for his people. <clears throat> um, Ezekiel 38 and verse uh, 19 in particular. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And Joel too uses the same language. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. And Zechariah 14 doesn't have the same, quite the same words, but it says that he's, God is going to come and fight for his people. And at some point, there's going to be an earthquake. And I believe with what we read in Zechariah, that is the point um, where Christ returns. Um, Ezekiel 38, verse 19 and 20. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. It talks about the fishes of the sea and, and the heaven and the earth, and the mountains uh, being shaken. The face of the earth shall shake, and the mountains shall be throw, thrown down. And the same language is used where it talks about this earthquake in Joel 3. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But of course, we're given a much more detail in Zechariah 14, um, verses 4 and 5, which is a passage we, we all know quite well, where we read, And his feet, and I suggest that this is obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And you can go to the Mount of Olives today and see where it's going to happen, which is before Jerusalem on the east and on the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And it talks about the, the earthquake, the days of Isaiah. So this is going to happen. We've seen that previous prophecies have come to pass. These prophecies are going to happen in Israel. They may seem outlandish now, but we know that God's word is true, and he said things will happen, and they have. And we know that this confederacy, as dooming and as uh, imposing as it is described as, will be destroyed. Ezekiel 39, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, and shalt and it talks about how they will be utterly destroyed. And later on in Ezekiel, it talks about um, the people of Israel having to go out and bury um, the, those of the confederacy of Gog. Um, it says in verse 11, shall stop the noses of the, pa of the passengers, uh, and, there shall they, and there they shall bury Gog. I thought that was interesting because uh, in Joel chapter 2, um, we read, but I will remove far off from you this northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up. So it's again similar language uh, between Ezekiel and Joel there, talking about this army being completely destroyed and the stink of them uh, causing the passers-by to turn their noses away. 
and Zechariah 12 and 14. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. And their flesh shall consume away, and their eyes shall consume away, and their tongue shall consume away. So they are going to be utterly destroyed. And it is this point that true religion is restored. With the confederacy being destroyed, the Lord Jesus Christ returning and setting up true religion. Because, as we've seen, it has all been pointing to this from the days of Abraham when God promised Abraham that he would inherit his seed and him would inherit the land forever. Ezekiel 39, uh, verse 28 and 29. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, their God. And this is what it's all been about, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. And this phrase, for I have poured out my spirit, is repeated between Ezekiel, Joel, and Zechariah. Uh, in Joel chapter 2, we see that it's the, re- the repetition of I am the Lord. And in uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 17, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. So this this phrase that God repeats, that he's going to pour out his spirit once again. And true religion will be restored. uh, Zechariah 14, verse 16, And it shall come to pass... That every one that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem, and even to go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And finally, uh, Israel will be blessed. It says that in Ezekiel, Joel, and Zechariah, all agreeing with each other. Um, Ezekiel 39, verse 17 to 22, which you can read um, in your, yourselves. But just verse 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves to every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you. Even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel. There's going to be celebration. There, there'll be plenty to drink and plenty to eat. The, uh, in Joel chapter 3, verse 18 it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down their new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth to the house of the Lord. And that's a phrase again that is repeated between Ezekiel, uh, Joel and Zechariah. This fountain of the Lord, the cleansing of the nations is going to come forth. And so I I know that's a very uh, quick overview of the prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. But... We can see this happening on a large scale in the news, uh, even today. Um, I'll show you a slide that I saw today. Russia and Syria condemn renewed U.S. sanctions and ally Iran. And you could take that from Ezekiel 38, that we know that uh, Gog says will be allied with Iran or Persia. And here's um, a very recent um, uh, summit that was held between these three countries, Russia, Iran, and uh, Turkey or Tagama. Um, We can see these nations in the news becoming closer uh, every day. This was today's uh, headline on BBC. Russia launches biggest war games since Cold War. We don't know what's going to happen uh, soon. We we pray obviously that things will happen soon, but we, we don't know exactly. It says that there will be peace in the land of Israel when Gog, uh, attacks Israel and apparently there is a, a, a peace plan from the Trump administration I'm not sure how much hope we should put in that but we never know and I thought this was very interesting actually um, was put on the Shirley Ecclesial WhatsApp group a while ago um, from an Israeli website, uh, news agency that earthquakes are increasing in frequency uh, in the very spot where it says the Mount of Olives will split in two So, I think my time is up, and I just want to finish by saying that um, prophecy, I hope, is is exciting for us, and 
um, is a worthwhile uh, study and uh, I certainly need to get my head around it in more detail. But just to finish with, um, I thought I will read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 6. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others. Let us watch and be sober.